Okay, this thing's on. Cool. All right, how are we doing? Another day? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see here. So in terms of announcements, what do we have going on? So you have a reading uh, due Tuesday. Is that the reading due date? Next year we should probably make all the things due on Wednesday, so it would probably be marginally easier. But that's too bad, you guys are grown up. So your, 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 your reading assignment's due on Tuesday, not Wednesday. Don't forget all that good stuff. Um, we put like a very long list of things on said reading list, so you guys should at least peruse the list of papers. Um, since we're now past the sort of weird, awkward initial part of this course where the reading is a little bit ahead of the content, like you guys are actually equipped to read interesting stuff at this point, and so there, there's plenty of papers out there. So there's like about, what, 5,000 different Lepashian related things, some algorithms for computing geodesics, you can read MMP if you like uh, excruciating pain. Um, there's some things on Laplace operators, uh, what else is on there? Oh, and I threw in some like manifold optimization style machine learning too, because that involves geodesics, and I like that stuff, and Nicola's my friend, so why not? Um, beyond that, you have a homework. There was only one person in my office hours uh, the other day, so I'm assuming the homework is too easy, and that's duly noted for next time. Uh, and uh, your project proposals all looked great. A few of you contacted me with questions about your feedback. If you haven't looked at your feedback, you should, because I wrote it. Um, yeah, any procedural things before we get started? Fabulous. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, right, so there's a little bit of uh, detritus left over from our last lecture because your instructor got confused. Um, and then we'll get started with today's content, which is really supposed to be next week, or last week's content by my original calendar. But that's a good thing because my goal this year was to take it slow, um, which as you can see is a challenge for, for me. Um, okay, so, so last time, um, I got a little bit stuck on the world's least interesting fact, and then as usual I stepped out. Actually, I'm not going to lie, I pretend like I stepped out of the classroom and realized what was wrong, but I didn't. It took me two full days until I realized that I was being an idiot. So, so let me sketch out uh, the fact that I was missing uh, to, to finish up our proof from last time, and then we'll pick up where we were before. Does that sound good? Fabulous. So if we recall our, uh, our story as it uh, was last time, in fact, backing up to the middle of our last lecture, uh, right? We're looking at embedding problems, so I give you a bunch of distances, and you want to give me a bunch of points that at least approximately have those distances between them. Yeah? Uh, and the first thing that we did was ask, specifically in the Euclidean case, um, we're going to kind of play a, a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? Like, if I knew that my distance matrix came from Euclidean distances, could I recover those points, at least up to rigid motion? Uh, and that's what uh, brought us this MDS uh, algorithm. Right, so we uh, define a matrix P, uh, whose entries are the squared pairwise distances. I guess P stands for pairwise, um, which was definitely intentional on the part of your instructor. Um, and, and then what we did is we defined a second matrix, uh, remember called the Gram matrix, uh, whose uh, entries uh, were just the dot products between these. Um, and these things are uh, related by a pretty simple uh, thing, which is just expanding the square, right? So, so we expand the square uh, in that relationship there, and what we got was that P was equal to minus 2 times the gram matrix, that's like the cross term when you expand the square, um, plus the diagonal elements of the gram matrix times the vector of all ones, um, plus uh, the opposite of that, so the vector of all ones times the diagonal of the gram matrix transpose, right? So that was what we derived last time. And what I wanted to justify was this formula that shows up an MDS algorithm, where somehow these two terms vanish, and, and then I got confused. It turns out, effectively, why I was confused was because it turns out the vector of all ones is in the null space of the matrix that projects out the vector of all ones, which is my bad, but let's, let's, let's really quickly uh, reproduce that. So, so Remember what we did is we solved for G, because uh, we're going to kind of reverse engineer all these steps when we, when we do MDS. Right? So if you write, and, and by the way, all these notes are, are on the Piazza page as well. Um, so, right, so if I write G, this is what? Um, one half times the, uh, these two guys, uh, right? So the diagonal of G. Uh, minus uh, P, right, so that's just algebra. Um, okay, and then um, what did I do? I said, one thing that we can do, like if I shift all of my points around in my embedding, I don't change their pairwise distance. So WLOG, without loss of generality, I can assume um, 
the following about the embedding without like somehow restricting the set of matrices that I can uh, reverse engineer, right? In, in, in particular, I can assume that all of my points sum to zero. By the way, if you if you prefer that, it's like saying you know that they average to zero, well, whatever. Um, okay, and uh, we define a matrix um, which is uh, the identity minus one over n. Um, oops. Uh, and you guys remember what this guy is? So what this thing does is projects onto the space orthogonal to this vector. Right? Got to go back to linear algebra class and remember how that works. Yep. So you know, if we think of all of our n as a big space, this is one dimension lower, uh, and everything in this, the image of j has what property? Well, effectively, that it sums to zero, right? Because it's orthogonal to this, so the dot product with the vector of all ones is just a fancy way of saying sum, right? Um, okay. So if I define um, a matrix big X whose columns are all the, the, the vectors in my embedding, right? Then, um, in effect, our assumption here tells us what? It tells us that big X times a vector of all ones is equal to zero. Right? It's just a, it's a different notation for the same fact. Okay. Everybody with me so far? So, so far, uh, we, were, we were so good last time. So good. Okay, so now um, uh, I got myself confused. So first of all, um, what would happen then if I take x under this assumption and I post multiply it by j? So last time I kind of talked my way around it, I watched the video, it was a little embarrassing. Um, alternatively, we could just do a little bit of algebra um, and say, okay, well, what is, this is x times j, which is identity minus one over n, like that, right? Let's just do this the old fashioned way, like math. Um, minus 1 over n, x times 1, 1 transpose, right? So I just plugged in, expanded, and now let's parenthesize this way, and, and what, what just happened? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this a little bit, because this is just left over, yeah? This is 0, yeah, by our assumption. Right, x1 equals 0. 0. Um, so, what did I show? I showed that if I post-multiply x, uh, by j, I just get x back under the assumption that, that my uh, uh, embedding was centered. Yeah? Okay. Fabulous. So now, uh, let's think about the gram matrix. Cool? Uh, Alright, so remember that the gram matrix G is equal to x transpose x. Uh, so in, uh, because of our relationship that we just wrote down, I can say that's j transpose x transpose x j. Right, just by plugging in x equals x times j, reading it that way. And what is the, what's in the inside? The gram matrix again, yeah? Isn't that sneaky? So this is j transpose gram matrix times j. Cool. All right. So what does that mean? Well, now I'm going to take this relationship and plug it in here. Okay? So, in other words, I can say that g is equal to this expression conjugated by j, right? So this is one half j transpose, and now we've got a bunch of stuff to write down. Diagonal of g, one transpose plus one diagonal g transpose minus p, okay, times j. I'm finally learning how to write with chalk. This was like something that I really struggled with in graduate school. Okay. Um, so then I stared at this in class, I got myself lost and upset, and then we talked about a different algorithm instead. Um, but we can also just look at this for a second and realize that all the terms I want to be zero are indeed zero here. Um, so, oh, uh, Okay. Uh, so in particular, I claim that uh, j transpose times the vector of all ones, so that would be like the second term here, is equal to zero. And we either know that by a geometric argument or by like one line of algebra. So the geometric argument is, is for one thing, it's j is symmetric, so the transpose here is a, a red herring. Yeah? Um, but what is j? j projects onto the, the, the space orthogonal to the vector of all ones. So if I multiply it by the vector of all ones, I get zero. Yeah, in case you don't believe me, let's, uh, let's just double check that real quick. So, j 
uh, transpose times vector of all ones. Well, by definition, J is up here, right? So he's um, identity minus one over n one one transpose. I don't like wearing dress up clothes. Uh, and that's multiplied by the vector of all ones. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's expand. So we get vector of all ones, and now we're going to get this giant expression with a bunch of ones in it, right? Um, like that. Okay. So. Let's read it like that. What is this thing? This is the dot product of all ones with itself. Yeah, so it's one plus one plus one plus one plus one n times. That cancels with the one over n. What I'm left with is the vector of all ones. That's subtracted from the vector of all ones. So I get zero. Yeah. If I transpose this expression, I get that. Yeah. So, uh, well, take a look at what happened. So here I got j transpose times 1. Here I got 1 transpose times j. So when I expand out, I get the expression I wanted. So this is minus 1 half j transpose pj. And that was the formula we were missing last time. So my apologies for that, missing that last little step there. I also drew you a picture of a cat in the course notes that are online. Um, any questions about that? So what did this show, by the way? This showed that if I have a matrix of squared pairwise distances, I can recover what? Can I recover the gram matrix of those points? So I have a bunch of xi's, and, and now I, I get, you give me this U, UA computes this matrix P, and that's what he hands to me. I don't have the xi's. Can I compute the, if, as a function of P, can I compute the gram matrix of those points? Nods? You're all wrong. No. I can compute the gram matrix of those points shifted to be centered at the origin. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, that's, and that's what this expression uh, is here. So I lost the global translation, which is uh, kind of expected, right? Because P throws that information away. Uh, but I can get the shifted version of that. Yeah? And then MDS, right, the algorithm, basically just inverts this whole process, right? So it says, uh, if you give me pairwise distances, I can go from that to P by squaring element-wise. I can go from that to the gram matrix, assuming that my embedding is centered. And that's the, the part where I, I figure out the information that I lost when I computed distances. But that's okay, kind of. We're usually okay with embeddings that are shifted around, right? Because that doesn't affect distance. Um, and then, uh, like we argued last time, the eigenvectors of, of G give you uh, exactly the embedding you want. Okay, so that's the MDS algorithm. My apologies for forgetting that if you project uh, the vector of all ones out of the space, you know, orthogonal to that, that you get zero. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my bad. Fabulous. Okay, so, so that takes care of, of some sloppiness for our last lecture. Um, but uh, a funny thing about this algorithm, I mean, so I'm an optimization uh, person, uh, except according to my, my tenure file, because I was told that was a bad idea. Um, but uh, in any event, because of that, uh, uh, notice that we did something a little funny here. I gave you a bunch of steps, but I didn't justify them. <laughs> right? like, I, I, I told you a story, which was, if I knew that P came from pairwise distances in Euclidean space, I could recover an embedding with those distances. But that's like kind of a corny theorem, <laughs> right? Because it kind of says, like, if my data, if I kind of already knew something more about my data, which, which means I probably knew where the points were to begin with, then I could recover them. Um, but, but people kind of apply MDS anyway, um, and that is justified. There's, there's theory out there that says that's an okay thing to do. Um, but we haven't written it here, right? Like, I haven't said that these somehow minimize some notion of distortion, for example, right? Which would be what you would expect uh, if you were going to do metric embedding, right? You'd want, remember we talked about these measures of, like, expansion and contraction. Maybe you try to minimize one of those uh, to, to get a good embedding. We haven't done that. Does that make sense? Cool. Now you're allowed to not. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. OK. Um, but in any event, it often works well, um, at least with kind of contrived data. Uh, but but a, a more realistic thing uh, to do, which actually historically comes from a similar time as MDS, which, which makes some sense. And sometimes MDS is efficient, right? It's eigenvalue computation, but it's not totally obvious. You've got to kind of justify it a little bit. I mean, the, the sort of totally obvious thing to do is say, OK, if I want pairwise distances to be these prescribed values d naught, the obvious thing to do is cook up an objective that 
measures how far away I am from that and try to make it small. <laughs> yeah? uh, and that's exactly uh, what this uh, smack-off model uh, does, right? Because my variables here are my, my embedding points, these xi, so stop giggling again, uh, and, and, and my, uh, <laughs> my prescribed distances of the d naughts. Uh, and so what do I do? I subtract and square uh, and try to minimize this thing. And, and like we talked about last time, this function looks innocent, um, but it's not. It's, it's actually non-convex, right? Uh, because uh, hiding inside of that square is, is a square root, right? There's a distance function uh, in, inside of there. Yep. So, okay, good. So I haven't managed to waste our whole uh, class yet. Um, so if you recall, what we did uh, at the very end of the last lecture last time is we took that square and we expanded it into a bunch of terms. Uh, the first term is a constant, right, because d naught squared isn't terribly interesting. And then the other two, uh, well, the second guy is quadratic, right, because it, it looks like um, just xi minus xj squared. That's kind of like what we computed in MDS. But then there's a third term, which is a cross term, right? This is d naught times the distance, and that's the thing that adds all the non-convexity to our problem. And so how do we cope with that? We cheat it, <laughs> would be the term I would use. Um, in particular, we said, well, one way to kind of pretend like it's, it's, it's quadratic is to hide all of the non-quadraticness in this weird matrix, right? So I kind of divide by x i minus x j and then multiply by it again. Uh, and now it's quadratic if I were to assume that b were constant. The only problem with this model is that b is not a constant, <laughs> right? Um, and so last time, uh, what we did is we said, okay, so at the very least, uh, this gives us kind of a nice expression for our objective, right? It's just the sum of these three things, which look innocent enough because I hid all the ugliness away in this weird function b. Yeah. Um, and we defined another weird function, tau, where what I did is I took my objective from the last slide, right? I've, I've copied it up here for your convenience. Uh, and I just took two of the x terms and I called them z. <laughs> yeah? And so now tau is a function of two variables, and it has this diagonal property that if I put in x twice, I get what? I get the objective for uh, Smackoff back. I should say stress majorization. That sounds more grown up. Okay, uh, and so, so uh, that's where we're at, and, and we quickly justified this lemma here, which is basically just Cauchy-Schwartz uh, in disguise. Okay, so that was our story uh, so far, and we've only lost 10 minutes. <sighs> okay. Um, excellent. So, so this function is called a, a majorizer, right? Uh, the word major comes from the fact that there's an inequality here. Um, and, and, and so the thing about it is this is kind of like an envelope sitting on top of your, your function, and when you minimize this thing, you sort of minimize an upper bound for the thing that you actually wanted to minimize, so you, you kind of never do any worse, right? So I encourage you to go online the Wikipedia page and just read a little bit about the MM algorithm in general. I'm really, really bad at cooking up majorizers for functions, but I wish I were better. So if one of you guys has a good intuition for how to do this in general, I'd love to hear it, because as far as I can tell, it's just a lot of like kind of guessing until you find one. Right? Like somehow in here, we kind of saw like, eh, there's a least squares problem almost there, so let's just like kind of stick it there and see what happens. Right? Um, and I, th I think that's roughly uh, how they got there historically. Okay. So. The actual algorithm for computing the embedding I haven't given you yet, right? I just kind of took a complicated problem and made it worse. Yeah? So now uh, let's show that this was, was worthwhile. Okay, so the, the basic algorithm uh, that we're going to cook up uh, is, is, is on the top of the slide here. And so I have to do two things. One is tell you that it is a useful algorithm, uh, namely that it decreases the objective function. Uh, and the other is show you that it's efficient. Okay? Uh, so I guess I should do... Uh, the first one first, so I should, I should show you that like, the algorithm actually does something related to my objective function, which by the way isn't totally clear so far, right? I took my variable and I doubled it in this function tau, and for all I know, when I keep one fixed, I kind of screw up the other one, right? I, mean, I haven't justified this at all. In particular, tau is not an inner product. I cannot swap the order of those two things and get the same value back. That is not true. It kind of looks that way because we're used to seeing notation like that, but it's not true. Okay, uh, right, so let's, uh, let's justify uh, our algorithm real quick. Okay, so what I'm going to show is that our objective function is monotonic uh, when I uh, use the iteration that's shown at the top of the board there. Um, okay, and, and let's do it real quick. So here's my objective function f, right? This is that, that, that stress majorizing whatever thing, okay? And I'm going to evaluate it at xk plus 1. My goal is to show that this is less than or equal to f of xk. Yeah? 
Okay, so by uh, definition, this thing is tau whoa, of uh, xk plus 1, just evaluated twice, right? That's how we define tau. We just kind of took the expression for f and broke it into some pieces. Okay, so first thing what we're going to do uh, is, is go back to our inequality that we proved on the last slide. And, and remember, like, what's our, our goal eventually? Like, eventually we're going to want, you know, something less than or equal to f of xk, right? That's, that's the kind of target we have in mind here. Yeah? And how are we going to do it? We're going we're to have to insert it into these two slots. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So take a look at this inequality. Well, this is starting to do what we want it, right? So one thing I can do is I can sneak an xk into the second slot, right, an upper bound. Yeah, so that makes this less than or equal to tau of the xk xk uh, by the, the, the lemma that we proved, right? That's this inequality here in the specific case of, of z equals xk. Cool, yeah? Okay. Now, how do we define xk plus 1? Oh, I took it away. How do we define xk plus 1? What is the min over all x of tau of x comma xk? Well, conveniently, <laughs> take, a, take a look. So there's an xk here. xk plus 1 is the minimizer over all possible things I can put in this slot of this expression where this guy is the variable. So in particular, right, this is less than or equal to this quantity, right? Um, uh, basically just by definition of xk uh, plus 1, right? Because xk plus 1 is the minimizer of this expression over where this thing is any x, yeah? Well, fabulous. So that's exactly f of xk. Uh, and we've shown that our, our algorithm is monotonic. Sneaky. Uh, and that's, and that's the, the general trick in, in, in this MM algorithm. You find one of these functions with this, this sort of property that you have uh, an inequality in the second argument, and then the first guy you just minimize. Yeah? Yes? I'm sorry, I couldn't parse that. Mm hmm. So you're, you're confused about minimum versus minimizer? Sure, one of them is a value and one of them is a variable? That, that's the problem? One of them is a function, one of them is a variable. should be argument. Oh, fine. Yeah, this should be argument. Is that the problem? This should be argument? Yeah, I mean, whatever. Yeah, I, it's like, just think of x like a matrix and tau like a scalar and choose whichever one makes sense in your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you're right. I mean, I guess that should be argument. I, uh, whatever. Um, okay, fabulous. So everybody agrees that this algorithm decreases the objective value at every step? Okay. Um, does that tell you the algorithm converges? No. Hey, you guys are good at falling into my traps. Or not falling into my traps, as it were. Um, yeah, so what does this tell you? It tells you that the objective value converges. Right? It's bounded below by the minimum objective value, which is some positive number, right? We did least squares. Yeah? But this thing doesn't tell you that the sequence of xk actually finds it. It just tells you that the value of, of f decreases in every step of this thing. There are theorems out there that tell you that, generically speaking, um, this thing, uh, the iterates converge, namely that the sequence of xk's reaches some local minimizer. Um, but that's a much trickier uh, matter. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, uh, convergence for, for MM algorithms, generically speaking, people are a little quick. They often prove this, this convergence property, which shows that the values converge, but they don't show that you actually reached a local minimum of the, the function. It's a much harder thing to show. Um, and in fact, it's fairly modern. Uh, like there, there are people in machine learning research that spend time thinking about that kind of thing. Um, yeah? That's a great question. I wish I, I knew the answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say linear because most things are, but I, I, don't, I don't actually know. <laughs> yeah, I, but I do know this is the technique they use in practice, so presumably it's not so bad. Um, yeah, uh, so, so anyway, uh, that's the MM algorithm. Uh, yeah, I know it's a company with a lot of... So one of the reasons why convergence is hard to prove here, 
Okay, when I say convergence, I mean of the iterates, not of the objective value. I've got myself all balled up. Um, is because think about what would happen. There's a chance that, for whatever reason, this algorithm, like the embedding, just keeps rotating in every step. <laughs> like for whatever reason, it just like rotates ten degrees every iteration. So it never converges, but actually the the embedding kind of. The, the, the property that you want for the embedding, that it imitates distance, that thing converges. So it's like a, it's a kind of a hairy matter to, to, get, it, to get it right. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the other thing we should do is, is tell you why this algorithm is useful, right? Like, what did I do? Well, I started by saying I wanted to minimize this function, uh, and now I have an algorithm that in every step of the algorithm has to minimize a function, so it's like somehow made it worse. Um, but the, the convenient thing is that this minimum uh, I can do in closed form. Yeah. Uh, so in particular, um, in fact, I think we can just kind of eyeball this. Uh, okay. So 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 tau. Remember, this is the form for tau that we we derived before. Uh, and notice, I I did something convenient. So um, if I want to minimize with respect to x here, then the z is held fixed. Do you see that? And I held all the annoying nonlinear part of my problem in z. Yeah. So this is least squares. So so this expression, right? The, the gradient with respect to the first guy. Notice that this is quadratic, so you're going to get like a v times x, right? That's hiding here, x times v, I guess. Right? This guy is actually linear. It does look linear, but this is all just a giant constant, right? Um, so you, you get, uh, you, you just get the constant term back, right? Um, and, and so that's, the, you know, what do we do? We want to minimize, so we took the gradient, set it equal to zero. And now, uh, what do we have to do? So to get xk plus one, we need to solve this for x. Uh, so let's do that really quick. Uh, so in particular, uh, what do we know? We know that x times v uh, is equal to, uh, and this is really, by the way, when I write x, I mean xk plus 1. I'm just tired of writing that. Okay. Um, is equal to xk times b of xk. v, what is v? Um, if you remember, uh, v from our, our last lecture is 2 to n times j, that projection matrix we had before. Yeah. So v is, is really um, like that. Can I solve for x? So Lorenzo is making a weird face, and, and he's right to. Uh, remember, what do, what do we define j to be? J is a projection matrix, so I can't invert it. You see that? But what is it projecting onto? It's projecting onto the space of stuff that's orthogonal to the vector of all ones. So I can kind of almost invert it. <laughs> Do you see that? Because I don't care. If I shift my embedding, nothing really changed. So I'm kind of okay with multiplying by the pseudo inverse of J here, um, because that's operating orthogonally to the space that, 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 that I, I, I care about. Yep. Um, and so, in effect, um, what I can convince myself is that it's okay to do uh, the following. Um, where this thing is kind of like the inverse of J in the subspace where J has an inverse. Right? That's what this notation means. And what is that? Like specifically, what is the expression for that? What is that? Nope. <laughs> what is a pseudo inverse of a projection? Can I undo projection? No. So the, the pseudo inverse of J is just J. <laughs> um, but although you're right, if I put the identity here, it actually wouldn't affect this algorithm because the shifting doesn't matter. Yeah. And so that's this technique. Uh, so at every step of the algorithm, all you have to do uh, is just compute this expression and, and iterate. And that's it. It's not so bad. Notice this is not linear, right? Because hiding in here is a divide, <laughs> right? which is this expression for, for, for B. Cool. All right. So that's, that's the, uh, this algorithm. It's just a few lines of code, and it gives you a, a way to embed your data uh, in, in, in kind of a nice fashion, right? Because uh, essentially, in some sense, this stress, this, this stress majorization idea really is just trying to minimize distortion, right? So like, if you get a small value for this, it's interpretable, which is kind of nice. On the other hand, we haven't shown that you can get a global optimum of this problem, and I think generically uh, you can. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so that's uh, this thing. This is sort of representative of, of a non-convex uh, technique for these sorts of things, um, which is nice. And, and, and indeed, this is built into a lot of these, uh, uh, and certainly MATLAB, Python, all these, these data science tools. I don't know if you call MATLAB that. Um, 
essentially they have a bunch of embeddings and this is one of the options. I think they usually uh, call it strain or stress minimization with some physical kind of intuition in mind. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and, and it often gives you really nice results. So, I mean, one thing that it does, for example, in a graph embedding is really ask that the edge lengths are actually one, <laughs> right? So, whereas the, the, the MDS embedding doesn't actually ever do that, right? Um, so, you get a much more intuitive uh, embedding pretty often. Yes? With initial conditions? Um, that's a good question. I think that, I know that the, the MATLAB library just gives you a bunch of options. You can either randomize it or something else. I think the standard thing to do is actually to use the MDS embedding for your initial guess and then use this to kind of refine. Um, yeah, um, but it's turtles all the way down. I mean, the nice thing about MDS is you can get the global optimum for, for what it is, right? It's just an eigenvalue problem. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay. Fabulous. And there, there are many applications of this beyond visualization, graph embedding. One kind of funny one recently um, is, is recovering shapes from their edge lengths. So maybe I have a triangle mesh, uh, and for whatever reason I lost the mesh itself, and I just have the list of, of edge lengths on the triangle mesh, and now I want to re-embed it. Um, it sounds corny when I describe it that way, but like if you uh, take this uh, slender gentleman here and you, you want to put a little bit of meat on his bones, maybe one way to do that is take the edge lengths around his belly and, 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 and make them longer and then try to embed again. Um, and, and they show that, indeed, this gives you some kind of uh, editing uh, operation. But I consider this to be like the canonical MDS paper, probably not, but it's, it's kind of a fun one to look at. Yeah? Could you use this for a sort of pseudo-compression type thing? Pseudo compression. Or just like to try and represent your data. Yeah, you can use it for actual compression. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So, so if you have extremely high dimensional data, you can try to embed it into a lower dimensional space and then just keep track of that. In fact, that's one of the main applications here. Yeah. Okay. Um, just so you guys are aware, there's a huge literature on different models for embedding where essentially all of them follow a similar formula, right? You cook up your favorite objective function which measures something about it uh, and then you try to minimize it. Another popular one you see in practice is something called salmon uh, mapping. This came out at about the same time as MDS and, and stress majorization and all these other things. So apparently this was a popular problem in the 70s. Um, the only difference here is they divide by D naught. Um, so what this uh, thing tries to do is like if you have small distances, it cares about them a little more than it would in the other model, right, because it's relative error. Um, one thing that I've always found fishy here, I, actually if one of you guys has a good explanation, let me know. Um, and I double checked it this morning because again, like every year I teach this and every year I think, well that's fishy, um, is why isn't it squared? <laughs> Notice the numerator is squared and the, no the denominator is not. Um, if you dig up the original paper in the 1960s, the way they get around this is they divide the objective function by the average pairwise distances, so the units kind of work out. But I'm, I'm actually unclear why they don't do relative square error. So anyway, if somebody has a good intuition there, I'd love to hear it. Um, so right, there's something kind of funny here, right? Like they square it, but then they only kind of take care of it halfway. But it seems to work well in practice, right? So here's a comparison between MDS and, and salmon. And you can see, uh, in particular, in these sort of clustered areas where really your cost doesn't get affected very much if you perturb your points, um, it, this thing does a, a better job of, of embedding. OK. All right, so that includes our sort of embedding stuff into Euclidean space uh, part of our program here. Um, and notice, what did we do so far? We sort of said, uh, Suppose I have a space with Euclidean structure, can I jam it into a Euclidean space, right? That was the problem that we tried to solve. Um, but there are many other generic uh, embedding problems out there, right? For any pair of two spaces, I could ask if I could essentially take my shoe and jam one space into the other. Uh, and indeed, a whole long storied history of mathematicians, computer scientists have considered this problem in different forms. Yeah? Um, so a very famous uh, version of this in mathematical theory uh, was studied by Nash and Whit Whitney and all these uh, famous people right, who asked the question of just generically speaking, how many dimensions do I need, for example, to, to uh, embed a Riemannian manifold? The answer is, is roughly two times the dimensionality of uh, the thing you started with. And so does anybody recognize this, this figure here? This is like a, a really nice drawing from the like math plus art world. <laughs> So this thing is a, is a torus, that much is kind of clear, um, but it's actually a flat torus. So this thing is kind of like doing origami on a sheet of paper uh, and, and trying to make a torus out of it, which is obviously a very tricky matter. Um, so in particular, uh, let me draw a torus for you guys. Ed, you're going to have to check that I got this right. So here's a square. right? And in topology, a very typical thing to do is to use this like kind of funny 
notation like that, which says that these might look like two different edges, but they're actually the same edge. Right? So this would be like taking this sheet of paper and then gluing them like that. And then how do I make a torus? Well, I take these two things and glue them together a second time. Right? So if I do that right, they're the same direction for a torus, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's a torus. <laughs> you might not believe it, but it is. Right? The only two tori I know how to draw are this and, and that. Um, but of course, uh, what, what Nash uh, discovered was a third torus, which looks approximately like that. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the basic point uh, that, that he was trying to ask was this thing, notice this isn't embedded, right? Like uh, there, there are two different sets of points that are kind of the same set of points <laughs> uh, here, right? So, so Nash asked the question of like, can I always take a topological space with a metric on it and jam it into a Euclidean space in a way where it like, truly looks like a surface, for example? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, if you give yourself a budget of a few extra dimensions, namely a factor of two. Um, but the object you can get is pretty crazy. So for instance, uh, this flat torus, right? So this is a space where the pairwise distances between every pair of points on here is the pairwise distance between every pair of points in this square. <laughs> Um, but they're a hell of a lot easier to compute on that square than on this uh, crazy fractal thing. Um, but this is just an example of sort of a, a crazy embedding problem that's been around for a long time. Um, and so, in any event, the funny thing is, is this is always the picture people in computer science use to justify some very simple algorithms, uh, which I find kind of entertaining. Um, but it is often true that the sort of intrinsic dimensionality of the data that you have uh, is different from the data that you actually have uh, in your embedding. And that's like a very heavy phrase for a very simple concept. So let's say that I'm filming a carousel. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, you know, Sebastian and Ed are, are sitting on the horses, they're going in circles, um, right? And, and so how many dimensions are really hiding in that data? Well, in some sense, maybe one or two, right? Depending on whether the horses are going up and down as they go around in, in the circle, yeah? Right, like, the, like they're just tracing out a circle like that. You know, Magnus is on there too, he likes the horse and it, it bounces and so there's a second kind of, you know, parameter going on in there. But what is the dimensionality of the data they actually observe? Well, it's like n by n, where n is the width of your photograph. Yeah? This is a very high dimensional embedding with a very low dimensional structure. Right? Uh, and, and this kind of picture appears in a lot of different places. Right? And, and um, so there are a lot of algorithms out there where, where that's what they're trying to do and in some sense, <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit, there's a little bit of hubris in saying you're trying to capture like what Nash was trying to do. Uh, in some sense, they're not wrong, right? They, they have some, uh, y y you know, object with some metric on it and they're trying to jam it into a particular space and, and know how well they can do that. Uh, and, and Nash says under some pretty weak assumptions, you, you can always do this uh, given enough dimensionality. Um, so a, a typical algorithm, um, you might uh, notice the first author is, is a professor here at MIT. I think this is actually his best known work, although if you see him now, it's largely in, in, in deep learning, uh, is it, something called Isomap. Um, and Isomap is a very simple extension of, of MDS, uh, where its job is to uh, reveal the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. So remember we talked about this Swiss roll data set last lecture, right? which is a bunch of points that are sort of sampled on a plane that's curled up in 3D. This is a good example of a completely contrived data set, but, but that aside, it's also a good example of something that is two-dimensional locally, but globally is, is 3D, yeah? And so uh, in Isomap, you're, so in MDS, your job would be, like you have pairwise distances between these points and you just want to put it in 3D. In Isomap, you want to put it in the plane. You guys get the difference here? Yeah. Um, so, so what do they do? Uh, they, they construct a neighborhood graph. So they actually put a graph on these points by just connecting them to their k-nearest neighbors. Conveniently, they chose k in this example so that they really did recover uh, the sheet. In general, I think that's a much harder problem uh, than, than what you've seen. Um, and then they compute the pairwise shortest path distance between every pair of vertices. And that thing is a distance matrix. Is that the distance matrix in 3D? No, it's, it's roughly distances between points on the point cloud, modulo all of the concerns we talked about in our lecture on geodesics, right? Um, but once you have that pairwise distance matrix, then you can embed it, well, you know, that's what MDS's job is, right? Just to embed uh, stuff given pairwise distance, and, and that's uh, step three here. Yeah, and that's, that's the isomap algorithm. This is one of the crowning sort of achievements of early data science. Um, uh, and indeed, I, I think it's one of the most commonly used uh, sort of ways to visualize a, a data set. Yeah? And so the only difference between this and MDS is that the thing that you're doing MDS on is pairwise distances on a k-nearest neighbor graph. Make sense?
Yeah, pretty straightforward. Is this, like, can I do this for big data? <laughs> like, like he hella big data, lots of data? No, right, because I have to compute pairwise distances between uh, vertices on a graph, I have to compute the graph, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, and so there's many, many methods out there that try to like subsample or compute landmarks or, or do all kinds of things to approximate because uh, this algorithm gets very expensive very fast. Um, however, uh, uh, pairwise uh, shortest path you can do fairly efficiently. Um, we're not going to cover it in this class, but if you haven't seen it before, everybody should Google this really clever algorithm called Floyd Marshall. It's just out of curiosity, have you seen? Interesting. I remember, I don't think the Stanford algorithms class covers it, so it was a different uh, survey result. Um, but essentially, this thing gives you the entire pairwise distance uh, matrix in just a few lines of code. So it's, it's uh, actually not so hard to compute, which is kind of sneaky. Um, if you haven't seen this algorithm before, from like 50 feet away, you can see what it's doing, right? It's taking triangles of points, and then if the distance doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality, make it satisfy the triangle inequality and just keep doing that. And essentially, the, the big theorem in Floyd Marshall is you, you only have to do that n times. Uh, okay, uh, so that's the isomap algorithm. Isomap is slow. Uh, one of many ways to fix it uh, is something called landmark isomap, which fixes some but not all of the problems. Uh, so in landmark isomap, what you do uh, is you compute the full k nearest neighbor graph still. So that's where it, it breaks down a tiny bit. Um, but instead of computing a pairwise distance between every pair of points, you just choose a few landmarks and compute their pairwise distances. So you, you kind of subsample your data a little bit and then you embed just that subset of your data, and then you kind of drag everything back with it. Um, so we're a little low on time, so I, th I think I'll refer you guys to the course notes where I, I work through uh, the formula for this. I, I don't think it's terribly exciting, it's just more linear algebra. Um, yeah. Okay, so isomap is always, always, always uh, presented uh, with the second algorithm, which does almost the same thing. Uh, does anybody know what the, the other one's called? LLE, locally linear embedding. Right? Like, I feel like anytime you hear isomap, LLE comes out in the same sentence. Uh, uh, and indeed, I think if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see that their entries are... Well, let's say right next to each other. I don't know how that works. Like in an encyclopedia, they would be. Um, you know, titled under, what, dimensionality reduction or something. Um, so isomap, what is, so, and this is sort of the difference between local and, and global structure, so it's going to be kind of nice uh, as we contrast uh, what we've done in the last couple of weeks in this class, right? So remember we started by developing all these different notions of curvature, uh, and then we talked about ge geodesic distance, right? And so geodesic distance is a, a global thing, right? Um, curvature is, is a local thing, right? It's just, it just it involves your neighborhood. So isomap um, is, it involves geodesic distances, right? It's computing like far away distances between points in your k-nearest neighbor graph. Um, LLE is more of a local thing. What it tries to do is find an embedding that just captures the relationship between you and your neighbors uh, and, and sort of says like, well, long distances actually might not matter a whole lot. Uh, and oftentimes this can be more robust, right? So for instance, uh, if, we, if we look back at this uh, 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 Swiss roll data set here. Maybe I get unlucky in my k-nearest neighbor and like I add a shortcut path here. I think that's actually the most likely scenario. Somehow they, they've managed to construct something where that doesn't happen. But, but you, you're very unlikely to only choose neighborhood in your tangent plane, right? Like somehow if you did, you would know much more about your data than, than you really do, right? And, and so what's going to happen to this algorithm if I have just one spurious edge? Think about it. Like suddenly these points, all these guys are super close to the, the beginning of my, my furled up sheet. Right? So this fails catastrophically in the, in the presence of one broken thing. Yeah? Uh, and so you, you have a few options. I mean, one is to like, I don't know, try to detect that case and fix it. But there's a chicken and egg problem there, because right? you don't know the dimensionality. That's sort of the whole point. Yeah? Um, so instead, uh, one thing you might do is just come up with a, an algorithm that's a little less sensitive to that kind of issue. Uh, and, and, and LLE is, is a nice example of that. Yeah? Um, so in LLE, notice that none of these things are, are variational in nature. Right? I, it's hard to say that any of them are optimal. These are just sort of sets of steps that are intended to roughly embed things. Um, right, so LLE starts the same way, right? So what it's going to do is for every vertex, it computes the k-nearest neighbors in my data set. That's pretty common for these embedding things because you somehow, the basic assumption here is that nearby points in your data set form something kind of like a tangent space. Right? That's the basic 
idea here. Um, there are some, some recent papers, I know Mathieu de Brun has some um, from Caltech that try to come up with a better notion of what it means to have a tangent space in a point cloud and improve LLE that way. Um, these things can be a little brittle and, and it's hard to, to think about the right notion there. But from there, uh, LLE does something a little bit different. It can be some objects which are going to come into play. Uh, we talk about finite element method two to three lectures from now, depending on how slowly I speak. Um, which are, it can be some objects called barycentric weights. This will sound familiar to our graphics students. So the basic idea here, uh, this sort of schematic to have in mind, is that if I have a densely enough sampled um, point cloud of a data set, and by the way, my manifold doesn't have a boundary, but we typically kind of ignore that issue, um, which is dangerous. Uh, let's say that I'm at a point here. Here he is. Uh, well, if I collect his k-nearest neighbors and my data is roughly like kind of identically distributed, whatever that means on, on a manifold, right? Then I have some picture that looks like this, right? So here's my k-nearest neighbor graph. And roughly every point is kind of at the a some aver weighted average of his, his neighbors in the k-nearest neighbors graph. This makes sense. It would certainly be true if they were all actually in the same tangent plane. Um, but of course, that's not really true uh, because like the, uh, you know, maybe your manifold is here, so all of your neighbors are, are like, you know, slightly offset. Um, we'll ignore that for now. <laughs> okay? Uh, so in uh, the LLE algorithm, um, what they do is they say, okay, I'm going to write, so these are the k-nearest neighbors. These are, that's what n is, not normal. I'm noticing that's a bad clash of notation for which I apologize. So for every vertex independently, I collect k nearest neighbors n. So these are the positions. And I solve a least squares problem for weights omega, which are saying I want to write the center vertex as a weighted average of its neighbor vertex, cis, vertices. Okay. Um, by the way, and by fiat, you take the, the, the weight of xi, like the point at the center, to be zero. Right? So the, the point here is that I should be able to kind of throw away point xi and still write it as a weighted average of its neighbors and kind of do okay, assuming that my data is pretty uniform and densely sampled. And, and for the most part, that's true. Yeah? So when I come out of this analysis step, what, I, what do I end up with? I end up with a vector of k numbers and a list of k neighbors for every uh, point in my data set. Yeah? By the way, uh, you can work out the linear system behind this. If, if, you, if you can't do that, I refer you back to the lecture two. Yeah? Um, and then, uh, right. And now we're going to fix these w's and we're going to do something kind of funny. <laughs> we're going to say that our w's are our ground truth. We're going to throw away our embedding because this is some high dimensional space that we don't care about. And we're just going to keep the w's around and we're going to try and find a new embedding that respects this average weighted property. Do you see that? So here, y, the columns of y are my new embedding. Okay? And if I take y and I post multiply it by w, what is this doing? This is saying, use kind of the same indices into this array. So like, you know, point number five is the embedding of point number five here. And so this is the difference between the embedded point and the same weighted average, but in a different space of, of the embedded neighbors. Did that parse? I know that's like a, a kind of a weird sentence. What is the, uh, t uh, for sanity check, what's like the kind of diagonal of, of this relationship here? Zero, right? Because you don't have a self-weight in this very centric thing. Okay? Um, so there's our least squares objective. It's saying find me an embedding uh, where everybody is kind of the same weighted average of his neighbors. If I didn't have this constraint here, what would be the global optimum? I can hear it being whispered. What's the global optimum of this function in y? Zero, yeah? And it's true. Every point is the weighted average of all of his neighbors with respect to any weight, so when all of your points are zero. Yeah? Uh, so to fix that, uh, we just add a constraint, which uh, says that this, this matrix is orthogonal, uh, and, and that's what gives you the LLD, LLE embedding. So yes, Colton? So we choose which the, the new dimensionality, and that's the dimensions of Exactly. So X would be probably a much taller matrix than Y. Okay. Yeah. Um, however, hiding in your question uh, is uh, the question I know that you intended to ask, which is how do I choose that parameter? Um, and the answer is it's really, really hard. Uh, and, and in fact, this is the downfall of most of these manifold learning algorithms, is that there's, a, again, a sort of chicken and egg problem. I don't know the manifold that my data was sampled from. If I did, I wouldn't need to reconstruct it. Right? And so somehow, 
uh, you know, choosing the height of that matrix Y is, is a tricky matter. Um, in some applications, in, in learning, in, in visualization, it's pretty easy. The height is two or three, depending on whether you have a 2D or a 3D display. Yeah? Um, but otherwise, uh, there's a little bit of engineering here. So some, some typical things you might do is like cross-validate, right? So w one thing you can convince yourself of is if I make Y taller, right? I give myself more dimensions. I see you back there. If I, if I make more dimensions to, to work with, what will happen to the objective value? Will decrease, right? Because more dimensions I have, the kind of the more wiggle room I have for my embedding, right? So one thing you do is just look at this thing as a function of dimension, and when it starts to level off, maybe that's that's the one that you choose, right? Um, and and so there's there's a, a term that I think a lot of data scientists use without really thinking about it. They call this a knee, right? So what they'll do is they'll plot. I think this is more common for MDS, where they'll say like, here's dimension. Here's some notion of error. Obviously, it looks like that. Um, and then oftentimes, you'll kind of choose a point like here-ish, because it kind of levels off. And they call that a knee, because there's like some curvature there. Um, precisely where that knee is is, is is very hard to say. There is a very famous paper um, from statisticians at Stanford uh, talking about, I think for MDS, uh, this sort of funny horseshoe shape that you see in a lot of these diagrams. But uh, remind me, and I'll, I'll dig that thing up. Yes? Yes. It seems like it necessarily should be less than the dimensionality of your original space. Well, certainly if you take your number of near neighbors to be the... Where it's from? Um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, so if, I, if I add too many, so, so to, to echo your, your question back, if I add too many terms here, this least squares problem will become underdetermined. Yeah, you're right. So if I choose this to be bigger than like three and my points are in 3D, I'm in trouble. Um, there are easy ways to fix that, right? I, I think typical thing to do is regularize here, right? Like add a little bit down the diagonal. Um, this is actually a great lead in to some of the things we'll talk about with the Laplace operator, because one of the main applications of Laplacian is for something called generalized barycentric coordinates, which is exactly this question, which is uh, if I have more than k points and I'm in k dimensions, uh, well, let's see, if I have more than k plus one point, so I'm in k dimensions, what, what does barycentric coordinates mean? Well, now there's some degree of freedom, right? There's a lot of things that satisfy these constraints, so I can now choose among some other criteria, like smoothness, uh, to make for a good uh, barycentric function. In fact, my plan was to get to that today. We'll see if that happens. But there's, there's no particular, like... I'm not sure in the original LLE paper what they did. Okay. What was that? There's no particular guideline. No, this is a thing that, that, that it's the same with like k-means for clustering, right? There's a lot, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot out there, but the, the, uh, the takeaway practically is people try a bunch and see what works. Yeah. These are all great questions, by the way, and you're right to poke holes in these algorithms. They're, they're, they're old school kind of heuristic stuff, <laughs> um, but very common and, and geometric in nature, so I thought you should know. Okay, fabulous. Um, one question you might ask or you should ask is, is what is the difference between these things? Um, and there are many. Uh, uh, so, so again, the basic one that I like to keep in mind is isomap is global, LLE is local. Right? So a, a famous data set for, for comparing these things. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, here's a good example. So here uh, we took a rectangle. By we, I mean Han et al. Uh, took a rectangle and punched a hole in it and then did these two algorithms. And think about what happens. So in... in um, Isomap, what happens to the shortest path, for example, between the two ends of the rectangle? Well, suddenly it got much longer, right? Because it has to cut around the hole, right? So when I try to embed, even though the rectangle is two-dimensional, with respect to this data set, when I embed, I get this funny hole here. Do you see that? Because it's trying to make these distances longer to account for that hole in the embedding. Because again, the point of isomap is to make just the extrinsic distance uh, sort of imitate the, the distance that I computed on the graph. Whereas LLE is just saying, well, these points are in some neighborhoods, so it's okay um, with it, it, it staying uh, flat. Does that make sense? So I think that's the most intuitive uh, comparison between these options. You could say, well, oh, well, uh, based on this example, I should never use isomap. <laughs> um, I don't think that's true. I think it's just more communicating that they do different things, right? Isomap really cares about preserving that distance function. Um, so one place where LLE often fails um, is actually in, in very small deformations of things like humans. So if I, if I just have, you know, an embedding of a triangle mesh of a human, 
And I look at pericentric weights, those are really local relationships between points, right? Uh, and so like if I move my whole arm, most points stay roughly at the very center of their neighbors when I did that. The only thing that changed is in some small area here, right? So actually from the, 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 the perspective of the LLE objective function, you, you did pretty well. Uh, and so it can be quite noise uh, sensitive uh, in that regime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are many, 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 many methods out there for embedding. These are just two of the most common. Another really popular one, which is on your reading list, and I encourage especially the math students to read, is something called diffusion maps. How many of you have heard of diffusion maps? It used to be super popular in, in applied math world. Um, so diffusion maps, uh, one way to understand it is a kernel method. Um, essentially, rather than computing eigenvectors of the distance matrix, you compute element-wise e to the minus distance and compute eigenvectors of that. Um, and it turns out this is backed by all kinds of really, really elegant theory because this thing sort of approximates the heat diffusion operator on, on your, your manifold. And, and so um, under very stiff uh, conditions, you can show that sort of this thing converges to some nice distance in, in heat kernel space. Um, and so this was uh, proposed, gosh, uh, 13 years ago? No way. Um, and it's like just a really popular tool in applied math because uh, it's, it's, you can say a lot more about it. Um, yeah, okay, so now we'll start to do our usual kind of grab bag of fun problems at the end of lecture. Uh, so, so here are a few. Um, one of the kind of funny ones, uh, which maybe we should revisit now that we all do deep learning, um, there are papers that manage to differentiate the pairwise geodesic distance function and then use that in an objective for optimization. So maybe like... I start editing distances between points on a surface and I want a new surface that has those, those geodesics. I don't recommend coding this. I think it's probably extremely, extremely difficult to get right. It's hard enough to just code up fast marching without having to differentiate it. Um, but, but the basic takeaways is this huge zoo of different embedding techniques. And I really do think that the, the state of the art in data science is just try them all uh, and, and see which one works for your data. Right? There's also, like Ed mentioned, TSNE on the way in. That's another popular one. Um, that one has some kind of funny properties. That, that, uh, it's not clear that that's trying to capture a distance metric as, some, as, as much as like similarity relationships. So to wrap up our discussion of distances, I thought I'd draw to your attention some other fun problems that are distance related and interesting to study. Um, maybe we'll briefly mention some details of one or two and let you guys read about the rest. Uh, as usual, I'm running behind. Um, but the, but the, essentially, this idea of embedding has inspired this huge literature in learning, optimization, operations research that involves sort of given some rough, noisy estimate of something that has to do with distance, do some other, Thing. So, so, for example, um, one kind of neat one um, involves like maybe I give you a matrix of pairwise distances, but that matrix was measured in a very inexact fashion. So, like maybe I keep giving you triplets of photographs and asking you for your opinion, like which of these three is the most similar pair, right? So, that's some notion of triangle inequality, and I tally that and I get a distance matrix. Um, then one thing you might do is certain of the algorithms we talked about, the guarantees only come if your distance matrix actually has a triangle inequality. Turns out humans, by the way, are famously bad at triangle inequality. Like if, if you ask people to just approximate distances, uh, uh, like their distances very rarely satisfy that criteria. This is mythology. Actually, I, I'm not sure what, I'm sure that there's some psychology paper out there that measures this, but I, I don't know what it is. Uh, but in any event, you might ask for like, what is the closest approximation of a given matrix to one that truly has for every triplet a triangle inequality? Uh, this is called the metric nearness problem. Um, one of the kind of interesting observations here is the set of tr matrices that satisfy uh, that condition, that is a convex set, right? Because it's just a bunch of linear inequalities for every triplet, right? And so it makes perfect sense to project onto that space. Uh, and indeed, uh, in, in this paper here, I'll, I'll refer you to um, the algorithm is extremely simple. You just keep, it's kind of similar to uh, Floyd Warshall. You just keep choosing triplets so if they don't satisfy the triangle inequality, you do some projection step. Um, and you can show that that thing converges. It's pretty neat. Uh, a different uh, algorithm, which is also fun, is maybe I only observe a few distances and I want to fill in the rest. Yeah, this is the matrix completion problem. It right? also shows up in like Netflix problem style stuff, although this is slightly different. Um, so here, uh, Let's, let's explain the notation a little bit. So, so D input is some incomplete matrix of pairwise distances that I've measured. And in this particular work, I'm going to assume that my distances are not just any distances, but they come from a Euclidean embedding. 
Incidentally, the set of distances that come from a Euclidean embedding is not the set of all distances. This is something that we showed, remember, at the beginning of, of last lecture. Uh, right. So H here is a binary matrix, which is a, just a mask. So it's just going to turn off places where we don't know distances. Okay. And what, uh, what these people choose to do is a nice application of, of what we've already talked about. So what they optimize for is not this, the pairwise distances uh, in the complete distance matrix, but rather the gram matrix. Remember, I can go from one to the other. And what do we know about gram matrix? Remember, it's X transpose X. So in particular, it's positive semi-definite, which is a thing that we like in optimization. It's a convex set. Um, and also, uh, how many of us know what the Cholesky factorization is? Is that a thing you kind of remember this term? Yeah. So remember, it means that if I have a semi-definite matrix, I can always factor it as x transpose x. So somehow this is an if and only if, right? So in other words, this set is exactly the set of, of outer product matrices. So essentially all these guys do is solve a convex problem, which says, find me the closest Euclidean pairwise distance matrix, which approximates it on the set that I have. Right? This little circle here is the Hadamard products, like element-wise. Um, yeah, so this is a convex thing. It's three lines of code in CVX, and, and it behaves nicely. Um, if you read this paper, it comes before a lot of the algorithms in semi-definite programming, so then they have to do a lot of work on, on actually uh, coping with this, this optimization. This is a separate matter. Lorenzo, you look puzzled. It does, yeah. So after you compute G, if you want to get the embedding, uh, what do you do? You take its eigenstuff, yeah. And that's exactly the embedding, and it exactly respects the distances you have. Um, there's only one problem, which is what is the dimensionality of that embedding? It's the size of your data set, right, in general, like unless the rank of G happens to be low. Which leads me to our le next and final algorithm, uh, which is something called, uh, thank you for walking into my trap, or not really, but then my putting words into your mouth that walked into the trap that I wanted you to walk into, um, which is fine. Uh, and, and that leads us to one more algorithm called maximum variance unfolding. Has anybody tried M MVU at home? Another fun one to play with. Um, all these are fun to play with, by the way. They're all like a few lines of code, and like you can take data sets and jam them into space and see what they do. Okay. Um, so there's one more number that I can measure about a data set. You should all get nervous. I'm, I'm paging in my notes, which means that there's likelihood of a mistake here. Um, okay. Here it is. So let's say that actually my, uh, let's say that we're sort of in the regime that you guys mentioned before, that like, I don't have enough distances to get a reliable embedding, so I have to put some other information on it. Right? So the simplest example would be I have Two points, or three points rather, and I have two edge lengths. <laughs> yeah, so there are many different ways to embed this data set, right, by just hinging about this uh, angle here. I suppose, and shifting, but we kind of know how to fix that, that problem. So one thing uh, that the, you might do is ask for the embedding that maximizes the variance of these points. And we'll draw a picture of, of what this does in a second. But first, let's measure it and, and, and see why this is not so hard to do. Um, and, and, and in some sense, you can already kind of see it, right? Because one way I can embed this data set would be like that, to kind of hinge these points close to each other. This has lower variance. It clustered them all together. And somehow you can already see that this is not a desirable embedding. Um, but not for reasons of these edge lengths. There's sort of a, a design decision here, right? This has nothing to do with the length of the edges, which is, is, is respected perfectly. Okay, so in, in any event, let's say that I have uh, my embedding, and I'm going to call it Y. I want to compute its variance. I'll define that in this case to be um, just take the pairwise distance squared of, between all the different points. Right, so and essentially what this is saying, this is saying in the absence of other information, I might as well make points far away from each other in the embedding. Yeah? Okay, so if I expand the square uh, and do all our, our favorite tricks, right? So then, then what do I get? I get that this is, notice I sneakily put a, one, a, a two there, <laughs> right? So the, the, the term with the same thing twice, just by the same formula that we had before, um, is, uh, is the sum of norms. Ah. Uh, right, so what I did is I, I expanded the square here. Right, this is the term where you get the same guy twice. 
Notice there's two copies of that, one for this guy twice, one for that guy twice. That's what's here. Uh, and then this is the cross term. Cool. So what do you think I'm going to do to make my life easier? Remember, I only care about distances, so oh, this is the sum of all the yi's. Let's just make it zero. <laughs> this is just a design decision we have to go back and remember. Yeah? And so, what is this thing? Well, one kind of cute way to view it is this is the trace of the Gram matrix. <laughs> right? And by the way, uh, no, not by the way. Yes, that's the trace of the Gram matrix. Okay, so I want to maximize the, uh, the variance. One way to do it is to maximize the trace of the Gram matrix. Um, and now, let's say that I have a bunch of prescribed uh, distance values, right? So I have like, you know, remember the, that, you know, D naught IJ uh, matrix as input. Maybe I, you know, square it as usual. Well, remember we have that relationship already, right? This is GII plus GJ. J minus G I J minus G J I. Remember that was what we got from expanding the square at the beginning of the last lecture? You guys see so far? I see some whispering here. This is just like taking this product and expanding it out, right? Because you'll get Y I dot product Y I minus Y I dot product Y J minus Y J dot product Y I, right? And that's what, exactly what these gram matrix elements are. So, so far, what is my unknown? It's G, right? Which is secretly encoding my, 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 my point, yeah? A nice thing happened. These are all linear relationships. Yeah? These are linear constraints. These are nice constraints on, on, on G, yeah? Uh, remember we forgot a constraint, which is that the sum of the y's equals zero? Yeah? So if I have a matrix y whose columns are, are, are all the, the, the embedding points, right? then I can say, yeah. What is the gram matrix? Is y transpose y? Yeah. So one thing I could do is multiply both sides by y transpose. Y transpose on zero, still zero. <laughs> so in other words, g times the vector of all ones. So that's certainly true. And then I just need one third constraint, which is g equals y transpose y. Um, well, in fact, actually, uh, before I get, well, we know that's true. Um, and of course, this thing is a semi-definite matrix. So, if I get rid of this constraint, is it the same problem? You're nodding, but that's actually not true. So if, for example, if y is rank 1, like I really want to embed into one dimension, then if I drop this constraint, all I can say is that I can embed into n dimensions. Yeah? Uh, so they're not quite the same, right? So I need to add one more constraint, which is that, so, but I can get rid of this matrix Y and say instead that rank of G is, is some fixed dimensionality of your embedding. Okay? Um, is this problem convex? It almost is. Do you see that? Like, this is a linear objective. That's nice. That's, a, that's convex. This is a linear constraint. That's convex. This is a linear constraint. That's convex. Semi-definite constraint is convex. And then we have this, this damn thing, which is like, what, a steeple manifold or some, some nasty set like that. So what do you think we do? Kill it. We kill it. We just get rid of it. Um, okay, and now what do we get? We get something that doesn't solve our original problem. <laughs> yeah? Or does it? Right? And this is actually a theme in some, some interesting modern uh, mathematics. So here's, here's the basic observation. So in general, we want the rank to be low. Yeah? In other words, we, we prefer not to use more dimensions than we need in our embedding. Yeah? Um, Here's a, a sort of a suggestive picture uh, to have in mind. So let's say that I have three points, just like I was showing you before, right? And they hinge about this angle. And notice, by the way, I've enforced a hard constraint on distance this time. I could make it fuzzy, but in this particular technique, they don't. Um, so what are all the different solutions to this problem? It's like hinging these points about the center here. Which one maximizes the variance? Straight, Straight line, absolutely. What's the dimensionality of a line? One. What's the dimensionality of the blackboard? Some magic happened. Yeah? Which is that with high probability, often what will happen in this maximum variance unfolding is I drop this rank constraint, 
And then by virtue of some analogy of this property here, I'll get a low rank solution back anyway. <laughs> yeah? It's total magic. If you want to actually prove that, you need some pretty modern results in semi-definite programming. Um, but the intuition is extremely simple. It's, it's, it's just saying that, in general, the best way to maximize variance is to kind of flatten stuff out as much as you can, and that corresponds exactly with getting a, a low rank uh, embedding, which is kind of what you want. So all the stars align for your problem. Now, can you control that k explicitly? No. Um, but you can kind of reveal a reasonable choice of k by looking at the rank of g you get when you solve this problem. And if you don't like that rank and you want it to be smaller, what do you do? Well, then you're stuck in heuristic land, right? Like you can compute eigenvalues and maybe truncate, and then maybe go back to the original non-convex problem, optimize that for a while, you know, or whatever you want. But that, um, that, that's the, the, the basic technique here. Um, so that's that. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention that, of course, there are many modern uh, machine learning architectures for embedding tasks, uh, the most uh, famous of which is shown here. Um, this thing is called word to vec Now, unlike maximum variance unfolding, how many of us have ever heard of or, or used word to vec Yeah, what a, what a universe we live in. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so the idea of, of word to vec is it really is uh, just an embedding tool. Do you see that? So, so all it's doing is taking, uh, in this case, similarities between words as measured by proximity in documents, uh, which is some rough notion of distance, uh, and then embedding it into a Euclidean space. Uh, in this case, using a deep network, but actually the deep network in this particular paper, I would argue, is not like super, like isn't really the interesting or critical part, right? Because um, at the end of the day, they really set up an optimization problem, which looks an awful lot like the MDS problems we've already written down, uh, and optimize it. The, the, the added sort of uh, trick being that they use a particular architecture to sort of say a good word embedding is one where I can kind of predict the context of a word, given the word itself. But that, that's really spiritually very much similar to like, what we covered in LLE. So even though like, the details here are quite different, they've inserted some nonlinearity there. Um, so the optimization routine is, is, you know, looks closer to TensorFlow than SmackOff. Um, the actual sort of setup, theoretically, if you read this paper, will look just like what we've already uh, basically discussed in, in lecture here. In fact, I double-checked. I downloaded this paper and, and read it the other day. And, and, and indeed, it really is it's not that far off. Um, this is kind of interesting in the world of deep learning because there's no convolution here and, and at the end of the day um, the thing that you get is an embedding of the dictionary and, you, and, and often the applications of word to vec completely forget where it came from. So there's a text file you can download on the word to vec uh, homepage which just for every word in the dictionary gives you a point in Euclidean space and at the end of the day that's all, all you really care about. So, so uh, they don't even, I think you can download the network that, that they, they use but, but most people don't. And so it really is just an embedding problem. Um, and indeed, there are many, many extensions of this work because it was quite popular uh, uh, and, and, and they're effective. In fact, one of the kind of funny things in this particular, this isn't actually the first word to vec paper, but it's the better cited one. Um, they added this, uh, the observation that somehow their, their network was learning this funny kind of algebra, right? Like the difference between Lisbon and Portugal is similar to the difference between Spain and Madrid, so there's some kind of vector structure hiding here. Um, I don't know who thought to check this. It's actually not enforced in their optimization algorithm as far as I can tell, but somehow it happens anyway, which is pure magic uh, as far as I can tell. So anyway, uh, with that, there, there are many other problems to think about that we haven't even touched on. This is easily the topic of an entire uh, course uh, in geometry. Um, some other fun embedding uh, problems to think about include, uh, if I give you a data set, is it embeddable at all? Uh, in other words, like, we can, but should we? You know, like, we have these algorithms, do we expect them to succeed? Uh, we, have, we haven't actually shown, right? Like, there are many cases where they don't. Um, and, and, and hiding in there are all the parameters of these algorithms. Like, what is the dimensionality? What dimension makes sense for intrinsic dimensionality, extrinsic dimensionality, and so on? Um, you could ask if two data sets are sampled from the same space. Right? In other words, are they somehow isometric to one another? Do we think this is an easy or hard problem? It's sort of hard with a capital H, right? It looks uh, like a quadratic assignment. Yeah? Um, and, uh, but there are all kinds of different, you know, similarity, averaging, uh, uh, and so on. And a very popular theme in some, some modern papers includes embedding into uh, some non-Euclidean spaces. A particular hyperbolic space has a lot of nice properties uh, that people play with. Um, there are hardness results in this area. Uh, in fact, one uh, hardness result, which should make you a little suspicious of, of uh, this Smackoff algorithm in terms of finding a global optimum, 
uh, is they show that optimizing this sort of objective, notice this is distance minus dij, and they take the absolute value in sum. So the only difference between this and Smackov is a square. Uh, that this thing uh, is NP hard to optimize. You, you, you can't actually do it. So in other words, we're pretty clear that the, al the algorithm we wrote down is, is just finding a local optimum. Um, and there, there are many uh, applications of this stuff too. So everything from compression to visualization and so on. So in our remaining like eight minutes, I thought I'd get started with Lepashin, since we're supposed to have a full lecture on that today, um, just to get you guys thinking about some problems, uh, and then we'll, we'll pick it up next time. But I do want to at least draw a picture for you to think about. Uh, okay. So that, by the way, officially completes part one of this course. We've talked about distances and metrics and, and sort of putting basic structures on geometric objects. The next chunk of our course is dedicated to calculus. Right? This is, what's the, you know that old music video with the you plus me equals us thing? I did that dance in high school. Um, but in any event, um, <laughs> basically the, the, what we're going to see, and this is where I think if you guys took a college level differential geometry course that might drop off a little bit. Um, right, so, so I think that typically begins and ends with curvature and, and geodesic distances. Um, now we're going to start talking about operators. Uh, and, and this is one of these key tools for modern differential geometry that is all over the place in the computational world. Um, and, and it really was all inspired by one uh, basic story that I've attempted to, to implement here. Um, as, 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 as a warning, um, nobody in the literature can agree on the sign of the Laplace operator. Computer scientists like it to be, uh, have a minus in front of what physicists like because uh, we want everything to be positive definite because we like matrices. Um, that's life. Uh, I've worked from about six different textbooks putting together materials for this course, so there's high likelihood that the sign will accidentally flip at a sort of junctures, and, and you'll have to catch me. But I did make a, a detailed pass, and I caught several of them this morning, so we'll see. Um, and there's a lot of sloppy math, because there's, there's a lot of nasty uh, things hiding here. Um, so in, to introduce you uh, the, the, the basic problem to think about, and then obviously we're, we're done for the day. Um, basically, many, many of these ideas go back to one famous paper. The reality is that they actually date much earlier uh, than, than this uh, paper, but, but this guy gets all the credit. Um, and for good reason. It's, it's a beautiful paper. Actually, it's, it's still really, it, it, you know, it's like uh, what some of these old TV shows. Right? This one definitely holds up. If you, if you read it, it's still interesting and, and easy to read. Um, and this is called, uh, Can You Hear or Can One Hear the Shape of a Drum? Right? And so uh, the problem, um, the, that was posed here at uh, Rockefeller University, I guess. For some reason I have it in my mind that it was at MIT, but I guess, I guess it wasn't. Um, looks uh, something like uh, the following. Uh, so, so CAC did not describe this in terms of the Muppets, but this is my preferred uh, modality. Uh, so here I have, uh, his name is Animal, right? And Animal plays the drums. <laughs> yeah? uh, and and uh, in particular, um, Animal's kind of a bombastic guy, so he's, he's playing the drums, and, and it's kind of noisy, you know, and we don't want to make eye contact, so we look at the floor uh, while we're listening to uh, Animal strike the drum. Right? So what do we get? We, we get an audio signal, right? It comes into our ear. And the question is, can we, given that audio signal, reconstruct the shape of, of Animal's drum? Yeah? Uh, Obviously, we don't get the same color, I think, that we would expect. Uh, uh, but it's less clear uh, whether we can get the shape of this drum or not, right? Um, so as, as a simple example, I mean, this is one of these problems where you first see it and you say, well, that's dumb, of course not. Like, somehow, audio is one-dimensional, drums are two-dimensional, so, like, something went wrong. And then you start, like, experimenting with a little, and you realize it's really, really hard to find two objects that sound the same. Like, go home, just, like, start picking up stuff in your kitchen and, and throwing it, and you'll see. Um, <laughs> And in fact, uh, uh, the reality is, is, is not a totally unreasonable question. So um, here's, a, here's a different example. So here's a guitar. Anybody here play guitar? Cool. I tried once. It didn't go well. Um, so, uh, right, so guitars have frets, they have strings, all that good stuff. Right? Strings are one-dimensional pieces of geometry and nothing more. Um, and what happens when one plays the guitar, right? You strike the string, it vibrates, it makes some sound. Uh, and now, um, this is the beginning and end of my guitar playing ability, I, I take my finger and I place it down on the string and then I pull the string again, pluck it, pizzicato, whatever. And then what happens to the pitch? It changes. In particular, it increases. Yeah? 
So if I want a high-pitched guitar, what do I do? I put a capo across the string, right? So it's like a fake hand that grabs onto it, uh, and that raises the pitch of, of all the strings. So let's think about that for a second. So what, what just happened? I shortened the string, right? I, made it, I, I changed its length, and in response to changing the length, the audio signal that came out of the guitar changed. So there's some link between geometry and, and vibration. And it turns out that's a very deep one. Um, and in fact, it's extremely difficult to find two guitars that, that sound the same. Yeah? Of course, that's probably more of a two-dimensional thing. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the spoiler alert here uh, is that no, there exist isospectral drums. If you want a tiny amount of extra credit, I encourage some of you guys to, to actually make... I, every year I, I ask this and nobody ever does. Um, if somebody can manage to engineer two drums that sound the same, like here's a diagram, you just have to go do it at home. Um, you, uh, I'd be really excited. <laughs> you can demo in class. Um, but, but, so uh, this is one of these uh, stories where the answer is no but. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it took, uh, actually shortly after CAC, uh, uh, I guess I see his name, uh, posted this paper, uh, somebody gave an a counterexample of, of isospectral objects. In other words, two things you can hit that sound the same. Um, unfortunately, those two things were embedded in 17 dimensions, so they weren't terribly uh, useful. Um, and it actually took all the way until the 1990s uh, to identify um, sort of a standard procedure for, for generating just simpler uh, two-dimensional examples. These are really hard to find. Unfortunately, that procedure is extremely general. Uh, and, and so uh, I actually, in the course notes, included a few pointers uh, uh, to methodologies. And I encourage you, if you want a really challenging read, uh, to look at it for your, your, your course reading. Um, there's a, a generic procedure that looks kind of like origami for taking one drum and then just constructing a whole sequence of drums with the same audio signal as long as the edges are kind of embedded on this integer grid here. Um, so this is a famous technique I think came from Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the answer unfortunately is a resounding no to the can you hear the shape of the drum. Um, but if you like slightly perturb a drum or something like generically the answer is yes. And so there's, these are kind of very rare uh, cases uh, that occur. Uh, and the reality is that if you know the spectrum of an object, you know uh, an awful lot. Or another way of putting it is that you can learn quite a bit about a shape uh, simply by hitting it uh, with a hammer. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably leave it with that for next time. So basically what we're going to cover for the next couple of lectures is a really critical tool in, in the computational geometry and geometric theory world uh, in maybe the last 50 years, which is kind of neat. We're going to jump forward a century or two. Uh, and, and, and talk about spectral geometry, which is all the different cool things you can read, which by the way include things like curvature, um, off of just the spectrum of a shape and maybe the shape of the eigenfunctions as well. Yeah? So of course, our, our, the first thing we'll have to do is define what does it mean for a shape to vibrate. Um, this actually caught me up. You can, I, there's a long Twitter conversation on my page now where I was chatting with physicists about like, well wait, the wave equation is a lie, uh, which I strongly believe, but we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, prove me wrong. But uh, uh, beyond that, we'll, we'll talk about the mathematics in the thing physicists call the wave equation uh, and, and what this tells us about geometry. The one final note here is that unfortunately this is also the end of the course notes. Um, I'm going to try this weekend to fill in a Laplacian chapter. It turns out it's very hard to write a textbook in parallel with teaching a course and, and um, justifying your existence to the university, but I, I'm going to try. So, uh, but uh, otherwise we'll rely a little more on the slides and I'll try to be careful that they have uh, the right content. Okay, so with that, we'll see you uh, next week. Don't forget your reading assignment and uh, your homework and all that good stuff.